our last chapter on the skeletal system, and we're covering the joints of the skeletal system tonight. This is chapter 9, which begins on page 269 in your textbook. So the purpose of this chapter is to introduce the various types of joints in the body, discuss how these joints are classified, learn the types of movements that can be carried out at a joint. So what is a joint? A joint is a point of contact between two or more bones, a point of contact between cartilage and bone, and a point of contact between teeth and bone. This is also called articulation or arthrosis. So we can classify joints. There's structural. Is there a joint cavity? And then that's going to determine what kind of a joint it is. And we'll get into that a little bit here real soon. And then what type of connective tissue is involved. So there's different types of connective tissue that help join different bones together and form a joint. Like, for instance, here I'll go over and talk about all that stuff tonight. And functionally, what degree of movement is permitted? So let's go on then. So this is page 270. So let's go through those. So we have a fibrous joint with no articular cavity. So... The articulating bone is held together by a dense irregular connective tissue. An example of this would be the suture and the syndesmoses. The sutures are in your skull, and the syndesmoses are the connections like you would have in between your ulna and your radius. Cartilaginous, no articular cavity. So, whom of the three classifications of joints, we have two that have no articulating cavity. So the articulating bones are held together by hyaline cartilage or fibrous cartilage. And then finally, the synovial joints, which have articular capsules. They're characterized by a synovial cavity and articular cartilage. They may contain accessory ligaments, articular discs, and bursae. So let's first talk about fibrous joints. And this is 9.2 on page 270. So, of course, they lack a synovial cavity. We established that on the previous slide. And the articulating bones are held together with dense, fibrous connective tissue. They permit little or no movement. And there's two types, the sutures and the syndesmoses. And the suture is found in your skull, as I just said on the previous slide. And if we look at figure 9.1, we can see an example of that. We see there the coronal suture. Now, one thing I'd like to point out about the coronal suture is see how it's kind of an irregular joint. See this line? And even when it goes through this plane, it's still a little bit irregular there. It's kind of curved. Well, that gives rise to the structural integrity of it and helps it to be more solid. So as we will divulge as the chapter goes on, there, there are no movable joints in your skull other than your the temporomandibular joint, which is basically your jaw, your lower jaw. And, and you can see here that all of the uh, sutures here then are therefore immovable. And that's another thing that goes along with the classification of joints is that they also kind of dictate how well or how much, to what degree, a particular part of your body can move. So your skull is protecting your brain, which is very important, and those joints are stationary. They don't move. And of course, we already talked about in previous chapters how the fontanelles calcify over time. And, you know, so like a baby's skull is, is more flexible than an adult skull. And a baby's skull is more flexible than a child's skull. A child's skull is more flexible than an adult skull. So I think the book throws out the figure by the time you're about six years old, those joints are really starting to solidify. And then as you get to where you uh, stop growing in your teens, those should be completely calcified and uh, prevent any a kind of movement and unless it's there's some kind of trauma like blunt force trauma might just dis dislocate one of these sutures and then that's going to spell a bad news for you uh, because then of course that could affect your brain the syndesmoses this is the tibia and the fibula so this is actually the, the lower part of the leg and you can see here this interseosis membrane well, this is just an example of a kind of joint, and it gives it some stability. 
And then here we have another type of syndesmosis is a gomphosis, and that's what we call the joint between the bone and the tooth, which is just basically, I think your book describes it as a wedge. It's the teeth are essentially just wedged down in this bone. And you can see here in between the bone and the tooth, there's a ligament. That's on page 271, figure 9.1. So here's a nice table for us. This table starts on page 283. Uh, so we can see uh, the fibrous joint, which is what we're talking about. Remember, we've got these three classifications of joints. So right now we're talking about the fibrous joint. And we're lecturing off of this figure here. The suture is immovable and slightly movable. And then they give the example of the coronal suture. And the syndesmoses, uh, they're uh, slightly movable. Table 9.2 on page 283. So that's where all this information is at in your book. So we're going to move on to cartilaginous joints. And this starts on page 272. And so let's see what it says about this. They lack a synovial cavity. We already established that on the previous slide. The articulating bones are held together with cartilage and connective tissue. They permit little or no movement. And the types of cartilaginous joints are the synchondroses and the symphyses. I believe that all of these uh, joints are found on your axial skeleton. But here's uh, the synchondrosis, which is an articulation between the first rib and the manubrium of the sternum. Of course, the pubic symphysis is also on the the axial skeleton. Here's an exception to the synchondrosis. So this can actually occur on the appendicular skeleton, but remember from, I think it was two chapters ago, the epiphyseal cartilage. Remember, this is where the bone grows, and then when you get to the point in your life where you're no longer growing, this is actually going to start to calcify. But this is a joint, and the bone, this is how it grows. And this is another example of the synchondrosis. So yeah, let me say this then clearly and correctly. The synchondrosis can occur on the axial skeleton or the appendicular skeleton. The symphysis, um, all of those occur on the axial skeleton. And again, we're back at is it the same figure I was referencing before. So this is again uh, table 9.2 on page 283. And I'll let you do that on your own time. Read through that table. In the synovial joints. Now, this is probably the most common type of joint in the body. You have a synovial cavity, so that's one thing that differentiates it from the fibrous joints and the cartilaginous joints. Sorry for having trouble with that word tonight. It's like a tongue twister to me. Anyway, articulating bones are covered with the articular cartilage. They're held together by ligaments. They contain synovial fluid have a nerve and blood supply, and are surrounded by an articular capsule. They permit a large range of movement. So let's talk about those for a minute. So here's just a simple a synovial joint. This is a coronal plane of your finger. So this is basically the middle part of your finger. And we can see that we got the bone, but... This is uh, kind of common to all of these synovial joints, is that they have this bundle. It's a bundle made of some kind of connective tissue. This is going to wrap around the entire joint, kind of like if you cut your finger, you might put a Band-Aid on that to help it uh, to heal. And it's not a Band-Aid, but if you think of it like a Band-Aid, it's just kind of holding everything together, giving it some stability. This slide is uh, 9.3 on page 273. So you can see here that you've got this synovial membrane and you've got this fibrous layer in between the synovial membrane and this piece of connective tissue. You've got the articular cartilage that surrounds the end of the bones. See, that's happening on both of them. And then in between here, you've got what we call synovial fluid. And the synovial fluid is going to help to give you some lubrication to help cushion your joints and to help them to move freely and without bone on bone grinding, etc. It, it's almost like uh, in your car, you know, you, you put oil in your car 
to lubricate the gears so they they run a little more smoothly and that's basically what the synovial fluid is in between this this sheath and this uh, synovial membrane we've got what we call a ligament which is just another layer of a connective tissue that's going to help hold those two bones together here in your finger. So the bursae and the tendon sheaths are on page 274 down there at the bottom right, but the bursae and the tendon sheaths can be found at many synovial joints. Bursae are sac-like structures filled with synovial fluid that cushion body movement of one body part over another, and the tendon sheaths are tube-like per se that wrap around tendons, and they are found at joints that have greater amount of friction than other joints. So it goes to say that maybe the knee, for instance, uh, the knee has considerable amount of stress put on it because it basically supports nearly all of your body weight as opposed to the elbow. I, I mean, they're I, sure if you're lifting weights or if you're doing some strenuous work, I'm not saying that you don't put stress on your elbows, but at least at least most of us aren't walking around on our hands all day, so our knees are getting kind of the brunt of that. So I would be willing to bet there's some tendon sheaths down there on your knees. So also then with the, the synovial joint. So let me go back a few slides because I want to illustrate something that I don't think I did before. These fibrous joints have no movement or very, very little movement, if any. Cartilaginous joints, they have virtually no movement. They probably have more movement than these fibrous joints would. But the synovial joints, they have maybe a medium amount of movement or very, very free movement. So that's why when we get to the synovial part of the lecture, we're going to start to talk about how bones move and the different types of movement that go along with the bones. So we can see one way that bones move is through gliding, and we see this in our hand. And this figure 9.4 on page 276 shows that the carpals of your hand, uh, they sort of uh, glide around each other when they move. And then we have also have this other thing called angular movements, and this is figure 9.5 on page 277. So we can see here the flexion and the extension. The flexing is this head movement, and then moving your head back is an example of an extension. And we can see that in the shoulder joint, and the elbow joint, the wrist joint, the hip joint, the knee joint, and then the intervertebral joint. So there's a little bit of movement there on your spinal column as well. So that's one of the other uh, many types of movements of the synovial joint. The synovial joints give us a great range of movement. And here's even more angular movements outlined for you on page 278, figure 9.6. Abduction and adduction. So when I move my arm away from my body, I'm abducting it. When I move it back, I'm adducting it. And we can see that with the palm and with the leg and even with the fingers. You see the amber alerts out there when you're driving down the highway. When a child is kidnapped, we call that abduction because they've been taking, taken away from their family. You never hear it in the news, but if it was a happy ending story and then the kidnapped child got brought back to their parents, that would be an example of abduction. Now here's some more angular movements for us. This is 9.7 on page 278, but you can see the circumduction, which is basically taking your arm and moving it around. And so this is more of a complex movement. Circumduction is the movement of the distal end of a body part in a circle. Circumduction is not an isolated movement by itself, but rather a continuous sequence of flexion, abduction, extension, adduction, and rotation of the joint. So you can see here that this idea of circumduction, I call it complex because it becomes the culmination of all of these different types of movements that we're talking about. It's not just an independent movement. And that's, I'm reading right from the bottom of page 278, bottom left to the top right of 278, so you can reference that. And here's another type of synovial joint movement that we see on page 279, figure 9.8, but rotation, shaking your head no, is an example of rotation. And then simple, like, anatomical position, right? So if I move something laterally, I'm moving it out. If I'm moving it medially, 
I'm moving it into the center. And then you can also see the model doing the same types of motion with her legs. And then the synovial joints also have some special types of movements. There uh, we can see the elevation and depression of the mandible. So you see the girl with her mouth shut and then with it open. You can probably maybe see me doing that a little bit as I talk. Protraction and retraction. So this mandible, I can stick it out, pull her in. And I'm not going to take my shoes off and show you how to do this, but you can do it there in your the comfort of your own home. Just take your feet and do an inversion and an eversion, and then dorsiflexion and the plantar flexion of the ankle joint. So supination and pronation of the hand. So when the body is in anatomical position, the hand, the palm is uh, supinated. And when we flip that over, it becomes pronated. And then, oh, what is this opposition? How the thumb moves across the center of the palm. That's what we call opposition. So those are some special movements of the synovial joints. Now, uh, when it comes to the synovial joints, page 282, figure 9.10. So we can basically break these movements down into a very mechanical idea here where movements that are either biaxial or triaxial, and it's showing the plane joint between the navicular and the second and third cuneiforms of the tarsus in the foot. So those would be an example of a joint that has biaxial or triaxial motion. The hinge joint, on the other hand, that we find in our elbows, well, that's what we call uniaxial because our elbow, we can really only move it one way. And then we also see here, what's this, the pivot joint between the head and the radius. So this is uniaxial. So again, types of movement, we can see the condyloid joint between the radius and the scaphoid of the lunate bones of the carpus of the wrist. So those are going to be on a biaxial plane. And then furthermore, the, between the metacarpal and the trapezium, another biaxial joint. And then our hip joint is what we would call triaxial. Yeah, you know, I mean, these are just kind of generic descriptors. But I always thought that, you know, like this ball joint that we have in our hip or even our shoulder. I mean, they're, I use some ball joints with my work. And I always call, consider them to be kind of universally movable. But I think what it's getting at is that, you know, you can move uh, anterior or posteriorly, superiorly or inferiorly, lateral and medial, right? We've talked about that one before. So this just goes through then and gives us a table where it discusses the movements of the joint. And this table is 9.1 on page 280. And you can see here that it just goes through the different types of movements of the synovial joint and then the description of those movements. So this is a very good table for you to study. And we talked about abduction and adduction and circumduction. We've covered all of these in my examples and following the figures in the book. And then this table just summarizes those for you. Now this table... Structural and Functional Classification of Synovial Joints. So there's major factors that affect the contact and range of motion of synovial joints. And one is the structure and shape of the articulating bones, the strength and the tension of the joint ligaments, the arrangement and tension of the muscles, the contact of soft parts, hormones, and disuse. So let's explore this a little bit. So the selected joints of the body, this table actually begins on page 285, table 9.3, there at the top of 285, and I think this also includes uh, 9.4, but let's go through this and make sure. So we see that the suture is between the skull bones, it's fibrous, and there's no movement. And then go through this table and read through all of these different types of joints in the axial skeleton. And that's going to bring us to the appendicular skeleton, yes, which starts on page 285 at table 9.4. And again, just shows basically how the joint, what it's called, where it's located, its movement, and then what its articular components are. Classification, too. So whether it's synovial or fibrous or cartilaginous. So the book then goes through some selected joints and highlights them. So they're very unique or they're very common. 
And let's talk about these a little bit. So the temporomandibular joint, which is basically your jaw, your lower jaw, is the only bone of the skull that actually moves. Its anatomical components include an articular capsule, an articular disc, a lateral ligament, a sphenomandibular ligament, a stylomandibular ligament, and its movements are depression, elevation, protraction, retraction, lateral displacement, and slight rotation. And this is figure 9.11 on page 287. The zygomatic process of the temporal bone there, you see how the articular capsule is touching. This is the uh, zygomatic process. And see, this is the temporal bone right here, and this is the process it's referencing. And this articular capsule is articulating with the zygomatic process, the lateral ligament as well. And then we see that we've got the stylomandibular ligament down here inferior to those two, and it's connecting with the styloid process of the temporal bone. So you see this little process protruding here. And then, uh, of course, this canal right here is the meatus of the ear so this is basically your ear canal and that's down there at letter a uh, 911 on page 287 well so here's b and you can just see that um, we've taken a little uh, section out of here so we can see this uh, sphenoid bone and this uh, little spongy bone here and we can see further the articular capsule and how it uh, seems to be articulating a little bit with the sphenoid bone too the styloid process, we can see that uh, clearly again. And now that we've removed this first layer, this lateral ligament here, well, we can now see the sphenomandibular ligament, which we talked about in a couple a couple slides ago. And we can still see the stylomandibular ligament. So those are just the basic parts, that, the ligaments that are going to connect the jaw and help. Next, uh, well, after spring break, we'll be getting into the muscular system and go into this in a little more detail. But this is part of the way that it helps our jaw to have the flexibility and the mo mobility that it does have. Now look here, uh, we can see on letter C on figure 9.11, this sagittal cross-section. So we can see this uh, synovial cavity. So remember, most all I think all synovial joints are going to have some kind of a cavity. That's how they articulate. And so you can see when we take this uh, sagittal cross section as you know, a spongy bone, and then we've got our cartilage and the articular disc and the inferior cavity, the superior cavity. And you've got the synovial membranes. And then contained within here is going to be some synovial fluid. And then, of course, right here is your mandible. Here's your meatus of the ear. So that puts them in perspective for you. Brings us next to the shoulder joint. The anatomical components of the shoulder joint include an articular capsule, a corocohumeral ligament, the glenohumeral ligament, the transverse humeral ligament, the glenoid labrum, and the bursae. And then you can see the different types of movements. So uh, being essentially a ball joint, you've got a great range of motion with your shoulder joint. Of all of the joints in your body, the shoulder joint is going to give you the greatest, the freest range of motion out of any other joint in your body. So let's look now at figure 9.12 on page 288. Last week we were talking about the appendicular skeleton, so we should be seeing some familiar parts that we talked about. Like, for instance, here's the clavicle. Now here's the humerus. But now uh, we see how the ligaments are articulating here and helping to hold this joint together. So the, the ligaments really help to hold the synovial joints together and keep them in position. Now this is on page 289, and it's the same figure, 9.12. But here's a superior view of the shoulder. And so it's superior here. And then, of course, this is uh, looking at it uh, anterior. So this is the front. Uh, we can see the bursa here. So this is the uh, first time that we've seen a bursa. One of the things you got to understand about joints is that when we have things like bursa, bursi, see plural, when we have those in our joints, they help to cushion our joints and they take the force. Let's say you have a chair, you have two chairs, one has a cushion and one does not. You, you probably feel like the one with the cushion is the most comfortable one to sit on. When you sit down on that cushion, 
It's taking the force of your body and it is dispersing that force over a wider area. Therefore, it's more comfortable. When you sit on that chair without the cushion, I'm not saying it's not comfortable. Uh, there's some very comfortable chairs out there without cushions, but uh, maybe it's not as comfortable. It's a little bit harder. Uh, you know, you can feel a little more uh, force there because that force of your body is just being pushed right down into that hard part of the chair. It's not dispersing it over that nice soft cushion. So that's really the idea here is that with the bursae, it just kind of helps to disperse the forces that may be applied to that joint at any given time. This is just letter C on figure 9.12, still on page 289. So we can actually see a, a cross section from a cadaver. So you can kind of see how it looks in real life compared to this cartoon. And like I said, I've done cadaver anatomy before. And yeah, these cartoons are nice, but every body, and I'm not saying everybody, every body is a little bit different from the other. And sure, I mean, it's in general, it's it's all the same. That's why we can use these types of cartoons here to kind of get the idea. But, you know, different people have their different sizes, their different shapes, but they're relatively the same. So, But this gives you an idea of what it might look like if you were in a research lab doing cross-sections of cadavers, or maybe if you were uh, working in an autopsy, then it might not be as clear as this is. But this does give you a very good idea. Like, for instance, here's your epiphyseal plate, and you can also see that here, too. The glenohumeral joint injuries. So this is talked about on page 291 and under the clinical connection. So this, this PowerPoint set that we have for Chapter 9 goes into the clinical connections a little bit more. Um, I don't think we've had that too much before, but... Injury, a, a common uh, injury for the shoulder is what we call a rotator cuff injury. Occurs from wear and tear, aging, trauma, poor posture, improper lifting, repetitive movements, and then dislocated shoulder, which means that the head of the humerus is displaced from this uh, glenoid cavity. So basically the, the ball and socket joint, somehow they get dislocated, can be very painful. I've actually put some joints back in that way. but So, I mean, I mean, if, if you're out in the field and somebody gets hurt and their shoulder's dislocated, it, it might be painful for the person, but you can definitely get that joint back in there. I don't want to say it's a break. Now, that's not to say that, I mean, if you have some, so much trauma that your shoulder, your humerus pops out of your glenoid cavity, yeah, I mean, there may be some tearing of ligaments, and so there may be other concerns but to help with the person's discomfort, it, it might be a little sharp pain there at first, but to get that shoulder back in there uh, could, could help them be a little more comfortable at least. And then certainly uh, once the shoulder is back in the, the cavity, they're going to be sore, but you might be able to tell if there's other uh, kind of damage that way. Glenohumeral joint injury, so we're still on page 291. This uh, talks about separated shoulder. So, yeah, this is kind of what I was talking about. I mean, if you pop that ball and socket out of joint, I mean, if you got that much force, it, I mean, you could tear this ligament. So the acromioclavicular ligament could be torn. And you can see how these other ligaments can get torn too. So it doesn't have to be all three. Maybe just one of them's torn. It's going to depend on the nature of the injury, the person, et cetera. Let's move on to the elbow joint. So this is on page 292, figure 9.13. The anatomical components of the elbow joint are, include an articular capsule, an ulnar collateral ligament, a radio collateral ligament, and an annular ligament of the radius. Remember what we said, the elbow is axial. This is all your elbow does. It can move flexion and extension. Extend, flex. Extend, flex. So this is 9.13 on page 292. What a collateral ligament does is, is it's going to surround the sides of that joint and it's going to prevent movement either laterally or medially. You get what I'm saying? So this uh, collateral ligament, the radium and the ulnar collateral ligament are, are going to be the outside or the inside of the elbow. We're going to go to the clinical connection here on page 293 and talk about tennis elbow, which is pain at or near lateral of the epicondyl of the humerus. Now, the term tennis elbow comes from a tennis player. When you're playing tennis, you're using this elbow quite a bit. And then when you hit the ball, 
there's still uh, some forces that will be absorbed by the elbow. And over time and doing this repeatedly, then tennis players tend to get this injury. But just they're not the only kind of profession or type of person who can get this injury. Frequent use of the elbow can give you that. And so you've got the little league elbow, which is something that's common in childhood. And then the dislocation of the radial head, which is, this is another uh, common thing for children where the head of the radius slides past the radial annular ligament. It doesn't sound too pleasant to me. It's probably pretty painful for a kid. But there's just common elbow joint injuries. So let's move on to the hip joint. The anatomical components include the articular capsule and then the iliofemoral ligament, the pubofemoral ligament, the ischiofemoral ligament, ligament of the head of the femur, the acetabular labrum, and the transverse acetabular ligament. And you can see the variety of movements here because once again your hip is essentially a ball joint, so it's going to give you a very, very wide range of free motion but not quite as free as you have in your shoulder. Remember, the shoulder gives you the widest range of motion. Probably your hip joint gives you the second widest range. Also, it should be pointed out that the hip joint is the strongest joint of the body. So here we see a cartoon of a hip joint, figure 9.14 on page 294. And so remember, you're seeing what's this? This is the pelvis and the parts of the pelvis. Here's going to be the pubic symphysis. So this is the medial, basically the center line of the axial skeleton. This is what I was talking about, how you've got this sheath. So this whole, all these ligaments are making this sheath that are cov covering up this, this ball and socket joint that you have here that help hold it together. So you got your femur articulating with your hip bone. And then you have a series of ligaments that are helping to hold that in place and either give it its freedom of movement or uh, restrict its movement. Because remember, uh, sometimes the ligaments are there to restrict movement too. So, you know, overextend and become injured or dislocated or something. More cartoons, the same figure, 9.14. This slide on the PowerPoint actually spans page 294 and 295. So again, this just gives you a little bit more detail here, but now instead of looking anteriorly, we're looking posteriorly. So we're looking at a, somebody from the behind. And then, of course, uh, we see here uh, we've got this uh, cross section taken out of here, and it shows us the spongy bone, and it kind of gives us an idea of how these other ligaments, and then, of course, how the hip joint or the femur and the uh, pelvis are articulating with one another. So the knee joint, the knee joint is the most complex joint of the entire body. It has anatomical components, which include an articular capsule, a medial and lateral patellar retinacula, a patella tibial ligament, an oblique popliteal ligament, arcuate popteal ligament, a tibial collateral ligament, a fibular collateral ligament, intracapsular ligaments, and we call those for short ACL and PCL, and the articular discs, and it has a bursae too. You see all the different movements there? Uh, not quite as much freedom of movement as we have in our hip and shoulder. A little more movement than we have in the elbow, though. Okay, so uh, what I was trying to get at is that remember the collaterals. So this, I'm just trying to help you with this. So I always remember the collaterals being on the side, right? Look at what it says under the movements, flexion and extension. The collaterals are helping me to prevent any kind of movement to the side where that knee might pop out of its joint, become dislodged or broken or any kind of injury that you could imagine. Those collaterals are really helping to, to keep that straight and keep it in its slot. So here we have a nice uh, cartoon of the knee, 296, figure 9.15. Yeah, so here's your collateral ligament. This is the tibial collateral ligament articulating with the tibia, and then we have our fibular collateral ligament, which articulates with the fibia. So remember, this is basically your shin bone. So this is the part of the bone that runs down the front of your leg, and then, of course, the fibula is a little bit posterior and lateral to that. But we can certainly see here that this knee joint is pretty complex. 
this part right here and this part, these are what we call condyles. And we've got these ligaments. So the cruciate ligaments, where that word comes from is cross. Remember I was telling you about that, the ACL and, ACL and the PCL. So the ACL and the PCL basically form a cross. So that's why they call them cruciate. But we call them PCL and ACL for sure. And then here uh, we see an anterior view here. And then we're looking down superiorly. And we've got these things called menisci or meniscus singular. It, again, it gets me back to the analogy of the, of the chair with the, the cushion on it. The meniscus or the menisces are basically just a cushion where your femur is essentially resting on your your tibia. And look at your tibia here, how it's kind of a plateau or table-like. So this lateral meniscus and this medial meniscus, they give that femur a little cushion to rest on. And that not only does it help to absorb shock, but it also helps to uh, give you a little more comfort down there so you don't have knee pain. And then here's just, uh, we see a sagittal section here. Again, the same figure, uh, 9.15, same page, 296. And then we see an uh, image from a cadaver here, so you can kind of see how it really looks if you were actually doing an autopsy or something or doing cross-sections of a cadaver. Continuing on to page 297, same figure. And now it's just a little more detailed, so we can see the patella is uh, sort of articulated with this infrapatellar fat pad, which is beneath there. You've got the patellotibial ligament. Anytime you see tibial on there, it's going to be articulating with the tibia. And then you've got these tendons that come in here, and they help to articulate with the quadriceps. So same figure, page 297. And this is some real pictures of the knee and how it actually looks if you were to be working on a cadaver, similar to the cartoon here except it's not a cross-section taken out of it. So here we're looking posteriorly. Here we're looking anteriorly. Our patella is right, right here. And then this is that patellotibial ligament we were just talking about. Here's the tendon for the quadriceps. And here's your femur. So that puts it into perspective a little bit for you. So it seems to be something that we come up with on every chapter about our, how we age and our uh, joints or our body in general as we age we start to have problems due to the pull of gravity or just you know you live your life and you do your work and you know things get worn out it's no exception for joints but as we age our joints experience decreased production of synovial fluid thinning of articular cartilage and loss of ligament length and flexibility Arthroplasty is the joint replacement surgery that can be performed to counter some effects of aging. So it shows an example here of arthroplasty, which would be hip replacement surgery, where basically they're going to use some kind of metal alloy. What they're going to do is they will literally cut you open. They take your femur and separate it from your hip. They essentially cut your leg off. And they're going to take a bone saw and they're going to saw off that head of the femur and they're going to replace that with a nice metal alloy a kind of ball that goes in there and they'll put it all back together. And it's very effective. I've known several people who've had this procedure and, it, you know, after a lifetime of, of work or whatever, uh, whether you're, or maybe an athlete, and sure, if you're a professional sports player, you're, you're working. But all I'm trying to say is people have different ways of life, and some people get dealt the knee placement, and some people might get dealt the hip replacement. Some people might not have to have any replacement. Some of it's choices we make. Some of it's the paths we choose. Some of it's genetics we can't help. But either way, I have found that people who have had the knee, knee replacement surgery are generally in a better place than they were before that surgery because, as I understand it, once you start losing that cartilage in between there and you start getting bone on bone, your synovial fluid's gone, I understand it's very painful. So this is a good option for that. And then here it's just showing a knee replacement. And this is on page 300, figure 9.16. But the part that talks about the arthroplasty starts on page 299.
And then, of course, there's disorders that go along with the loss of the uh, function of the joints and rheumatism and arthritis, Lyme disease, sprain and strain, tensosynovitis, and the dislocated mandible. So just a couple of things real quick before we adjourn. Rheumatism and arthritis. Make sure you can distinguish between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis and gouty arthritis. So we talk about three different types of arthritis in the book. And rheumatoid arthritis is basically an autoimmune disease, which means that it's your immune system attacking your body. Osteoarthritis is just a degenerative joint disease. So over time, your synovial fluid and your cartilage and things like that break down, and that's going to give you the osteoarthritis. So the thing, rheumatoid arthritis, usually if you have rheumatoid arthritis in your right hand, you're going to have it in your left hand too. It seems to work that way in most cases. Not necessarily true with osteoarthritis. For instance, if you're a tennis player and you're right-handed, and you know maybe uh, you're going to get that osteoarthritis in your, in your elbow. I'm saying you have. Not saying all tennis players get that. I'm just saying they use that a lot. They have a history of tennis elbow. It doesn't have to be a tennis player. It can be a, a weightlifter or, or any anything that's going to put strain here. But frequently using this and not so much using this one, you may see osteoarthritis in like the right arm, but not necessarily left. It doesn't always come in pairs is what I'm trying to say. And then gouty arthritis. Gout is where you start to lose the ability to excrete uric acid and that builds up in your system and it creates these crystals that can lead to kidney stones. It can lead to joint pain. There's a lot of things that go along with that. Lyme disease uh, affects the joints, and that's caused by a bacteria that you get from ticks. And then sprain and strain. Uh, I can actually speak from experience. I've sprained my ankle more than once, and it is no fun. I'm sure I've strained my ankle before, where I can probably still use it, but with a sprain, it's, just, it's common in the ankle. That's why I'm using it as an example. You don't only get a sprained ankle. I mean, you can sprain your arm or whatever, depending on what happens. But that joint gets bent in a weird way, and the ligaments get overextended. So what that means is that there's going to be an inflammatory reaction. It's your body's first line of defense in your immune system, where the B cells and the T cells are going to go down there. It's going to get hot. It's going to get heated. And it's going to swell up, may even turn to a different color. That's just because your body's doing its job. Your book says what we can do for that is something called price. So if you get a sprain or a strain, get protection. So you get a splint that you can put on there, rest it, don't use it. I've actually sprained my ankle a few times, but the last time I sprained, I really did it. I had to use crutches for a while. It was so bad. So rest, I mean, don't use it. And like, I'm just an active person. So I still had to go out and do stuff. So I just I had some crutches and I'd go around and do my job while I'm on crutches. And of course, I'm, I'm limited in some ways, but at least I could get out and do stuff. Uh, it was challenging driving with my left foot. I sprained my right ankle. Fortunately, I wasn't driving a stick that time, but use your one foot on your gas and your brake. Now, if you've got a stick, of course, you know, you've got to use gas and brake on one foot and your clutch on the other foot. So it would have been hard for me to drive if I had a stick. I keep ice on it. it, helps the swelling, and then compression, so you can wrap one of those ACE bandages around there and then keep it elevated, lay back and put a couple pillows under it and try to keep it above your midline, and all that stuff helps. And your book call, has an acronym called PRICE, so if you remember that, you're good to go. Well, anyway, class, that adjourns us for Chapter 9, and that adjourns us for the skeletal system. Thank you.